Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to share with you. Our text today is found in Matthew chapter 16. And our subject out of this chapter is evidence-based faith or faith-based evidence and how this applies in our life today and why it's so critically important to us. But before we begin, I just invite you to join me as we pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for your word. We would have no idea about the meaning of life, the purpose of life, the destiny of life, if it wasn't for your word. So we want to say thank you that we have the privilege not only to read your word, but to come together in fellowship and to reflect upon your word and for your Holy Spirit to make an application of it in our lives that we may all be richly rewarded by the blessings that come through the reading and the study of your word, because it's really to know you. That's why we've come not to know about you, but to know you as our father, as our creator, as our savior, and as our forever friend. We anticipate the day whenever we will get to see you face to face, and never be separated again. So bless us, Lord. We thank you for hearing our prayer and answering it. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Okay, let's start right in with Matthew. If you have your Bibles, open them to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 1. The context of this, as, as I've shared with you before, it's very important to understand that whatever, whenever we begin to read or study anything in the Bible, we need to know what, what comes before it and what comes after it that gives us an understanding of what the situation is, what the subject is. And in chapter 15, just a reflection on what has gone on before in the last, from verse 21 on, that's just where I'm reflecting from. We have the story of the woman of Canaan who came out of the same coast and cried unto him saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And it, the story, <laughs> it appears as if Jesus is just totally ignoring her, he, neglecting her. He, he's not interested. But as we read through the story in verse 24, it says, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. So here we have the story of a woman, not of Israel. A woman that was slighted and apparently slighted and neglected. But she had absolute confidence that Jesus was the Messiah. That he was able to heal her daughter. And so the outcome of this is that Jesus says, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And then in verse 30, it says, And the great multitude came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet. And he healed them. <laughs> so we have a single woman of great faith. We have a multitude who came and brought their lame, their blind, their dumb, the maimed, and many others, and cast them down at his feet, and he healed them. There are profound lessons in these stories because when we put ourselves into the context, where am I? Where are you and I in our faith in God's ability to heal? You see, this woman came believing that Jesus was able to heal her daughter. And she was determined to, to have that healing. 
because she knew who he was. <coughs> and so they got what they asked for. They got what they asked for. So are you and I content to live with less than the healing that God can give? And God is able to do anything. That's what the woman said. Lord, you can do it. I, I know you can do it. I'm nobody, but I know you can heal my daughter. And the multitude brought all their lame and blind and maim, and they just cast him at his feet and said, Lord, you can heal them. And not one of them were disappointed. So are we bringing our, you know, our need for healing? What area, what do you need healed in your life? Is it a relationship? Is it a health condition? Is it an attitude? It is, un, is, it, is it unemployment? Is it uh, the need to find a home in the country? What is it that needs healing in order for you to be a whole person? And that whole person simply means to be in the center of the will of God for your life. What is it that you need? God says, are you willing to come? Are you willing to ask me and to trust me? Because I want to heal you. But so often we come Sabbath after Sabbath, week after week, and we, we come with the need for healing and we say we're coming into the presence of God. We, we believe that God is the God that lived 2,000 years ago on earth, of which these stories record. He's the same. But we leave with the same hurts and wounds and sickness and disappointments because we won't really believe that he can heal. So I want to ask you today, what is it that you are still wanting to be healed from? But you haven't been healed yet because you really haven't believed that God is able to heal you. And as I said, it may be an attitude. It may be a, a relationship. It may be a circumstance. It may be financial. Are you willing to believe, and like that woman of Canaan, are you willing to persist no matter what the response may be in the sense of circumstances and not seeing the answer? It's like Elijah up there on Mount Carmel. He didn't see a cloud, but he said to Ahab, get down off the mountain because it's going to rain. Seven times he had to bow. But he had confidence and faith in God, that God had promised that it would rain. He had sent him there. The contest was over. And that he didn't have to see the evidence in order to believe the evidence and to persist with God in prayer until the answer came. So, so often we come to church, the very place we come into the presence of God. And as this multitude, he healed them all. <laughs> what would happen in our churches if everyone who came with a hurt that needed healing, whatever that hurt may be, what would it be like for everyone to leave that church today healed? You see, this is not a fairy tale. It's not just a, a make-believe story. It is a reality. It is a reality. And we have to ask ourselves the question, do I really believe that some miracle is going to happen today? That someone is going to find Jesus and they're going to find that healing that he demonstrated 2,000 years ago. And he wants to do the same today as he did then. But do I really want to be healed? Do I really believe that he can heal? So now that takes us into chapter 16, because we have all these evidence, all the signs. And in chapter 16, it says, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempted, desiring him 
that he would show them a sign from heaven. Now, remember the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were also in the crowd. They were also in the multitude. They witnessed all these miracles. But you know, in this very first sentence, we discovered that there will never be enough signs to convince one against their will. There will never be enough signs to convince one against their will. They didn't want to believe. He answered and said unto them, when it is evening, ye say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign and there shall no sign be given unto him, unto it, but the sign of the prophet of Jonas. And he left them and departed. Hypocrites. Verse 5, and when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it's because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets took up? <coughs> neither, verse 10, neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to your to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then they understood <laughs> they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but to whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjonas. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I say unto also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, <clears throat> and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, we're all familiar with this, with these particular verses and how that they have been distorted by the Roman system. But I want us to stop and take a very careful look at the, the real message that we find here. <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me in these verses excuse me just a moment to just have a have a drink okay chapter 16 so the context here now is the pharisees are looking for a sign jesus said you're hypocrites because you can read the signs if you can read the signs in the skies, then you can read the, the signs that you're asking of from me. You're not blind. You can see it. But the, the yeast, the leaven of the Pharisees was what? It was expectation. Expectation formed, shaped by tradition 
by opinion, by the the power of the church in their proposals as to what is truth, as to how the Messiah would come, how the kingdom would be established. That's what shaped their thinking. All the evidence before them, no matter how much evidence they had seen in the miracles that Christ performed, the, the lives were, that were transformed, all the evidence that they were given was not enough because they were so jaded by their expectations and traditions. And so we have to be very, very careful in the sense of our expectations of the times in which we live. And our expectations are so low that we don't even believe that God can perform the miracles. That would be sort of supernatural. That would be unusual. And so people leave church. We don't dare pray expecting miracles to be performed because, oh, that would be presumption. And yet that presumption that we assume is presumption is the very denial of the power of God to, to heal. Because God obviously is not the same God today as he was back 2,000 years ago. He can't do that today. He doesn't do that. Yeah? Since when? How many people have been deprived <laughs> of the miracle of God's healing power? Because we don't believe that God's capable of doing it. Therefore, we dare not pray expecting God to perform that healing. You see, our faith is so weak. It is so low. It is so insipid that it mocks God. Because we don't believe that he really can do it. And we haven't, we haven't even seen it ever happen before. So how do we know it's going to happen? Well, this Sarah Phoenician woman, she came to God, to Jesus in absolute faith. She didn't come and ask for signs. Lord, what's the sign so that I know that you can heal my daughter? She said, Lord, you can. And so whether as a church... Or whether as an individual, am I willing to come to God and expect miracles? Because we're going to see a lot of miracles in the days ahead when the Holy Spirit is poured out. And the Holy Spirit, once is, as Ellen White said, is already being poured out. But am I willing to receive it? Because it takes a lot of faith. And when Jesus and the disciples came down off that mountain of transfiguration, Jesus said this type goes out only by prayer and fasting in the previous verses. <laughs> Do I really trust? Now, the significance of our, the focus of our verses this morning, when Jesus asked Peter, who am I? Who do you two men say that I am? And then Peter responded and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed. That means stupendously blessed. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjonas, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. What's the significance of this? You see, it's humanly impossible to recognize God. It is something that the Holy Spirit has to reveal unto us. The Canaanite woman, she was not initiated. She was not, you know, Abraham's seed. But the Holy Spirit had revealed unto her the Messiah. The multitudes who brought their lame and maimed. They were enlightened by the Holy Spirit. And yet the church leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the very people who thought that they were <coughs> the epitome 
of spiritual insight and knowledge. We're totally ignorant. Because one class of people wanted to believe they were seeking for the truth. The others were not seeking for truth. They were simply seeking to justify their own prejudices. And in some way to disapprove, to disprove that Jesus was the Messiah. Where do you and I stand among those people? What is the Holy Spirit revealing to you and I? What is he revealing? Do I really see Jesus? Do I really know that he is who he says he is? And that can only come through the Holy Spirit. And the point of the, the message here is, let's look at a few verses here. I'm going to take you to Psalm Deuteronomy. Chapter 32 and verse 4. In verse 18, we're going to go, and I, and, and I also say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What is he saying? In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4, open your Bibles there. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4. It says, he is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. So what is the rock? We can say it's God, yes, he is the rock. But the rock is, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment of God, judgment of a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. So God is the rock. He's just and fair. He is trustworthy without iniquity and just and right is he. Another one is Psalm 62 and verse 7. Psalm 62 and verse 7. It says, in God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. In verse 6 says, he only is my rock, my salvation, he is my defense, I shall not be moved. This rock refers us back to the first experience of, of the mention of the rock <laughs> when God stood a mount, stood on Mount Horeb and he uttered the Ten Commandments. Those Ten Commandments were a declaration of his covenant with man. God's declaring who he was, his character, and that it, he takes full responsibility for this ragtag group of a million or so people that he had brought out of Egypt, that he would transform them in character and he would transform them as a nation to be the light of the world. That was his promise. And so we're 3,400 years from that experience. 3,400. God has, is still making that promise to his people today. That he will transform them. They will be the head and not the tail. They will be the light of the world. That's the rock. And when you and I accept that he is the rock, that he will do what he has promised. That he is just and true. 
He's the same God that Jesus revealed in his day as he is our rock today. But when he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. <clears throat> there is a transition going on here. That the Holy Spirit is the one that reveals it. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal who Jesus is. And he says, I say unto thee, unto thee, that thou art Peter, Petra, which means a pebble, a stone. And upon this rock, the Petros, it's the cliff, the immovable rock. I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What is he saying? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. How is God building his church upon the rock? How does he do that? He is doing it by raising up a people who trust that God is who he says he is. He is the same God that declared himself upon the mount when the Ten Commandments were given. He's the same God. And that he will do today what he did then. Is that happening in your life? Are you trusting in God? Because remember in this chapter, in this chapter, there is doubt. In chapter 15, there is no doubt. The, the woman of Canaan, the multitude that brought the lame and maimed. But, but here in this chapter, there is doubt. Because now he's dealing with the church. And that is introduced by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And I want to take you back now to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, here in the Gospels, We have miracle, we have ful prophecy fulfilled over and over again. I'm just looking for this particular verse. We know in, in Matthew, in the story of the, the Magi who came to Jesus. They had no other evidence than the prompting of the Holy Spirit, which directed them to the word of God. That was their source of instruction. And they followed it. And so just as the narrative begins with these wise men coming, led by that star that they saw, that was a fulfillment of prophecy. They followed that star. And as a result, they made the announcement that Jesus, the Messiah, was born. Then you have in when Jesus was brought to the temple to be dedicated. And in verse 24, in verse 25, and it says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. 
And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. And for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all the people and to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. Here is a man, Simeon, just and devout, waiting for the consolation of the comfort of Israel. He was led by the Holy Spirit. God spoke to him. Why? Because those who are looking for Jesus will see him. And here was a man who was expecting. He, was, he came, verse 27, he came by the Spirit into the temple. And he, at that very moment, because of his expectation to see Christ, he saw him. And then you have Anna in verse 36. There was one Anna, prophetess, the daughter of Penuel, the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. She was in the temple day and night, serving God with fasting and prayers. And she came in at that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So the scriptures tell us very clearly that. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal to you Jesus. And perhaps the Jesus that you're seeing is the Jesus that you have imagined him to be. He's not really the God that can heal, that can deliver, that can set free multitudes. What, what kind of God do you see? Do you see him for who he truly is? In your own life, are you living out the miracles of God's grace and healing, bringing healing into your life or not? What kind of a God do you see? Because Jesus is building his church upon the rock. Upon the rock. And he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hell is simply death. Death can't prevail against it. Because God's word is sure, it is certain. And then in verse 19, when he says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What does he mean there? I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. What are keys, first of all? Keys are something that you can use to lock a door and open a door. It says, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, remember the very context of this is that Peter is declaring that Jesus is the Christ. <laughs> and Christ says, that's been revealed to you by the Father. And just as the Holy Spirit revealed unto Simeon and Anna, as the angels announced to the disciples there on the hillside. And the spirit guided the wise men. Now here is a new hierarchy. And that hierarchy is led by the Holy Spirit because it is now no longer dependent upon the traditions of a church or an institution or an organization or a uh, uh, academics it is based upon the leadership of the holy spirit because only the holy spirit will lead you into truth because if simeon and anna had listened to the church 
they would not have been expecting to see a babe in the arms of peasants there in the temple. Because <laughs> the church wasn't looking for that. That's why when the wise men arrived and the Pharisees and Sadducees were demanded by Herod to tell him where the Messiah was to be born, and they told him. But did they go and see? Did they check it out? No. Because they were their thinking was shaped by the church, shaped by tradition, shaped by their expectations. And Jesus had to deal with this the whole three and a half years of ministry with his disciples, even until the very end. That so much of our thinking, our expectations, and our relating to God is based upon expectations, based upon what we've seen in the past, what we believe is the truth, what the church teaches as the truth. And so we are now so comfortable with the normal of not seeing miracles, of having no expectations that when people come to church that they're going to leave healed. And that's what Jesus demonstrated whenever he healed those people <coughs> on the Sabbath in the sanctuary. Jesus was flying in the, what he did flies in the face of our own lack of expectation of what God can do. And yet we say, oh, we believe in God. Yeah, do you? What kind of a God do you believe in? Your God is no bigger than your expectations. The Holy Spirit wants to reveal to you and I the truth about God. The truth about God. That's the rock. We're going back now to the rock. He's going to build the church upon the rock. His covenant. And that rock is that God is true and just. He will do what he says he will do. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we have minimized, we have trivialized our expectations of God. <laughs> and so what do we have to offer to the world? Because remember, we are going to face days ahead, folks, when there is going to be miracles, not from God, but from the devil. Because the devil is going to trump this one. He's going to use all these miracles as evidence. And it's going to look like a false revival. It's going to look like a true revival. Because God's people haven't been living with the expectation of the God they say they believe in. The devil's going to show up and for apostate Protestantism, Catholicism, and all the other religions. He is going to demonstrate that God is still the same God. He wants to perform. He can and will perform miracles. But God will have a people. That's why he said to Peter. I will build my church upon this rock. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. What are the keys? Revelation, there's only two mention of keys in the Old Testament, uh, New, New Testament. And Revelation 1 and verse 18, let's just go there and read that. Revelation 1 and verse 18. <laughs> It says, verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Keys of hell and death. So what does that mean? It means that you and I, the church, is God's agent for revealing the truth to the world about life. About life. 
He says, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Why? Because now the Holy Spirit in this new hierarchy of leadership in the church on earth, the Holy Spirit, that's why the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the early church was so important, because now the church is built upon the hierarchy of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's the one who is guiding. He is the one who is directing. And our, our confidence and trust is not based upon what we feel or what we think or what the church teaches, but it's based upon the word of God that was inspired by the Holy Spirit and it will also be directed by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will take the word of God and lead you into all truth. And so you and I have to ask ourselves, am I truly a spirit-led individual? Am I listening? Am I responding to the promptings of the Holy Spirit in my life today? Because God's church is based upon the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And as I said, the leadership of the Holy Spirit is displayed and in written form through the word of God. But it's also in the leadership, even though that lady, that Canaanite woman, possibly had never read the scriptures before. But she was led by the Holy Spirit. And God is going to raise up his last church. There are going to be thousands, millions, I believe, of people who are going to be spirit-led. That God is going to bring into a knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ. And so because now it, it, we are led by the Holy Spirit, then remember Jesus is ministering. The Holy Spirit is doing on earth what Jesus is ministering in heaven. And so because we're now under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, what we shall bind on earth has already been bound in heaven because Jesus has given that directive to the Holy Spirit. Just as the Holy Spirit is living out the life of Jesus, administered by Jesus in now the present time in the heavenly sanctuary. The Holy Spirit is simply fulfilling what Jesus is ministering. And so whatever you loose on earth, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the one now that is leading and guiding and fulfilling the will of God through his people. That's through you and me. We are the church on earth that this has been exercised on, into. And so we have to ask ourselves, am I spirit led? If I'm spirit led, then I will be, I will be believing the word of God. I will be believing it. And if Jesus says, Give, has given us the promises that I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Then today, right now, whatever victory <laughs> you desire in your life, whatever you desire in your life, whatever you need in your life, whatever victory you need in your life of overcoming, maybe it's appetite, maybe it's attitude, maybe it's <laughs> Maybe it's impatience. I don't know. We all have to deal with these things. But am I going to live with that and accept that? Or am I going to say, Lord, by your grace, I'm done with that. I'm done with that. Thank you for your victory. That I do not have to live one more day being impatient. Say how that's not possible. Is it not possible? Into that barrel. Może chcieli z niego zrobić frytki. Maybe they wanted to make uh, like not say, possible? Uh, a chip out of all fritters. So God is appealing to you and I today. Do we really want to be his church? Do we want to be built upon the rock? Do we want to take God at his word and to experience the miracles of healing that he wants to bring into our lives? 
Are we going to be content with just being mediocre, living with the crippling effects of our weak, with our weak faith? Are we going to live the victorious life that the Holy Spirit has promised, that has been given to give to us? So that's the message today, folks. God has demonstrated his power in the past. He has poured out his Holy Spirit upon the early church. He is going to pour it out again in this last generation. But he can only pour it out upon those who believe that God is the rock. And that we are standing upon him. And that with he has promised to fulfill, he will fulfill in each one of us. There's all kinds of temptations that come our way to, to doubt God and to, uh, you know, to just keep playing church. Or do we really believe that God can do what he has promised to do? As he said to Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you. And God wants to reveal things to you today, this week. He wants to reveal to you what his will is for your life, for your, for your family, for your community. And for those who are willing to trust and believe, then you will experience these miracles. May God bless you as you choose to step out and expect the miracles of God in your life this week. May God bless you. But can you close with prayer, please? Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the stories that we can read that are real, that are true. That you are the same God today as you were whenever you walked the streets and the roads of ancient Israel. We want to experience you, Lord. We want to believe and to trust and to experience this life. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of being your children and that you will entrust us for the Holy Spirit to live out your perfect life and your perfect will in our lives. And that we may express the loveliness of your character, your thoughtfulness, your kindness, your mercy, Lord, that these are not just ideals that we aspire to, but these are realities that are ours today by faith in your word. And we claim your promises. And may we live this life of joy and blessing and privilege that the world may see that we have been with Jesus. Bless my brothers and sisters who are listening today, and may we experience, may we allow you to live your life in its fullness in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.